California, and I am welcoming you to our National Maritime Day uh, via Zoom. And thank you all very much for coming. Um, this day is really devoted to two people, uh, two types of people. One, all of you in the maritime industry who are participating today, and thank you very much for your service. Uh, Stas, I'm muted. I can't hear you. Stas, you're muted. Stas? Stas, you're not even there anymore. Okay, <laughs> okay you're, here they are. You're back. <laughs> okay, as I was saying, I want to thank all of you who are participating for all of the work that you're doing because the industry is what is a key element in, in making us operational and getting things in and getting things out. And I wanna thank you for your service. Uh, the second uh, item on the agenda is I'm going to ask everybody to just briefly introduce themselves so everybody knows who you are. And uh, uh, Todd, you're the first person. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, um, Todd Croshaw, uh, businesses Croshaw Design, work uh, on the website. And do uh, corporate identity work and uh, brand and uh, website design and development. I'm helping out today doing the IT. Yeah, I, and I, I can't do without them. So thank you very much, Todd. <clears throat> Welcome. Anita Yao. Anita Yao, the harbor master for Port of San Francisco at the Fisherman's Wharf and uh, Hyde Street Harbor. Very good. Anita, thank you very much. Uh, Ellis. Hi, I'm Ellis Wallenberg. I'm with Weiss Associates. We're environmental engineers, and we do a lot of work at the ports. Thank you very much. Um, uh, who, uh, Frederick. Frederick Schloff. This is Fred Schloff. Hello, Hi. everybody. I'm with the National Shipping of America, and I am the director of uh, marketing and communications. I'm new to the company but I've been in the industry for about 30 years. Very good, thank you, Fred. Uh, Mike, Mike Chapman. Uh, Mike Chapman, member of the uh, uh, Wilson Color Club, Port of the Golden Gate. Thank you very much, Mike. Andrew, Andrew Huang. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Huang, I am the new uh, manager for business development and international marketing for the Port of Oakland. Thank you very much. Uh, Arlene, Arlene Henneman. Good morning, good morning. I'm Arlene Henneman. I work with Tori um, over at National Shipping. I do contracts and marketing for the company. Thank you, Arlene. Ed, Ed Washburn. Uh, good morning, Stas. Ed Washburn. I'm Senior Vice President of Fleet Operations for Pacer Hawaii. Very good, thank you. Uh, Kelly? Kelly Moore. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Senior Vice President, uh, U.S. East Coast, U.S. Gulf Coast for Centerline Logistics. Uh, you may have formerly known us as Harvard Marine Services. We've been around just a little bit. Same, uh, same company, uh, just a different name and a, a new outlook. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, Kimberly? Yeah, Kimberly, Centerline Logistics. I do marketing relations out of our Seattle office. Okay, hold on a second. Ah, get to work, Todd. Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to mute all. Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me? I'm unmuted. Sorry. All right. Let's try that again. Uh, uh, Kimberly, did we get to you? Kimberly Cartagena? Yes. Okay. Uh, who is, I have uh, Patrick Donnelly. 
Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, Patrick Donnelly, City National Bank. And among other things, I'm involved with our ports and logistics vertical. Welcome. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Tori Presti. Hi, good morning. Tori Presti, uh, President of National Shipping. We operate uh, between Houston, Texas and San Juan, Puerto Rico in the Jones Act trade. Thank you, Tori. Uh, Nicholas Marone. Nick? I've lost Nick. Go down the list. Oh, hold on a second. All right, Nick, let's try that again. Oh, all right. I, um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Nick, I've lost you for some reason. Um, let me try. Nick, can you hear me? Okay, Nick, we're going to have to come back to you. I've got, um, uh, I'm going to come back to Nick. Uh, Ron Brown. Ron, are you there? I am here. Good morning, everyone. Happy Maritime Day, and most importantly, happy Friday. Um, <laughs> Ron Brown with the uh, Port of Oakland, the uh, Maritime Marketing Division. Thank you very much. Uh, Crystal Doro. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, Crystal Doro, I'm with First American Equipment Finance. Uh, we're a subsidiary of City National Banks, um, and I work with Pat in the Northern California Marketing, financing marine assets and logistics, and et cetera. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug Houghton. God. Doug, I cannot hear you for some reason. Hey, good morning. Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Doug Houghton, Centerline Logistics, uh, Senior VP of West Coast Operations. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, okay, so um, Emily Sinclair. Emily? Emily, I can't hear you. Okay, nothing is working for me. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I can hear you now. Oh, you can. Okay. okay. I apologize. I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, this is Emily with the Pacia Group. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, okay, I have uh, Eric Nelson. Eric, are you there? Yes, sir. Um, I'm the Digital Media uh, Director for American Journal of Transportation. And Eric is the guy who makes sure that my stories uh, appear. So Eric, I'm very glad that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now I have, uh, oh, uh, Laura, Laura Covery. Hi, Stas. Hi, everybody. Um, happy Maritime Day, Laura Covery. Um, I am a consultant. I have my own company, Environmental Maritime Services. I also am an adjunct professor at uh, Cal State Long Beach, UCLA Extension, and the Maritime and Environmental Training Trust in San Pedro. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. And you're in Long Beach. Yes. <laughs> very good. Okay, thank you. Um, Roxanne. Hi, everyone. I'm a guest. I'm actually Ed's wife. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, welcome. Welcome Thank very you. much. Um, Susan Sullivan. Susan? Hi, I'm here. I'm here. I just, um, I work with the Pesha Group. I'm the manager for the Overheim Widen Project Department. And I'm one of the board of directors for the Propeller Club. Very good. Susan, thank you very much. And are you all by yourself in that office today? Uh, pretty much. There are one or two other people here. Ed's down in his office. Ed's down in his I office. I think he okay. is. Of course, I think he is. I can't see him. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Um, so uh, I am checking to see 
Uh, the only person I'm a little worried about is uh, Nick Marone. Nick, can you hear me? Stas, I think you forgot Mr. Mr. Nerney also. Oh, Mr. Nerney. Oh. Good Here, morning, Mike. everybody. Good morning, uh, Mike uh, Nerney, Port of San Francisco. Thank you very much, Michael. I'm glad you could make it. I had to beg him, but I, after I pleaded with him and told him that I, I could, we couldn't do without him, he showed up. Michael, thank you very much. Last in, first out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. Nick, can you get in there? Can you, we hear you, Nick. I think he's muted. Nick, you have muted yourself. We cannot hear you. Okay, uh, I'm going to um, right. uh, hope. How's this? Can you hear yes. me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yes. Okay. Okay, Nick, introduce yourself. I'm president for the Seafarers International Union, West Coast. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Jerry just came in. Jerry, who just came in, is that Jerry Swanson? Yes, it is. Hey, how are you? Very good. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Jerry? Okay, uh, Jerry Swanson, just got in from my morning exercise, but uh, former captain of the port for San Francisco Bay, uh, former director of safety and security for Pacific Maritime Association. Very good. Jerry, welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody. Um, I am going to uh, uh, mute everybody and then read the uh, president's uh, proclamation. And, um, uh, and then I will come back and uh, we will take it from there. Uh, the proclamation is uh, from President Trump, obviously, and it reads as follows. Proclamation on National Maritime Day. Since the founding of our great nation, we have relied on merchant mariners to deliver goods to market and strengthen our national security. On National Maritime Day, we recognize the United States Merchant Marine for all it does to facilitate our commerce and protect our interests at sea. Uh, hold on a second, I, somebody's coming in. Um, we, okay, so I lost my, okay. Our nation's merchant mariners enable peaceful trade with countries around the world and provide vital sea lift support to our armed forces. Whether on the ocean or on our inland waterways, merchant mariners support our economy by transporting billions of dollars of imported and exported goods. These men and women also sail bravely into combat zones to deliver supplies and weapons to our military men and women, playing a critical role in the success of their mission. This year, as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of World War II, we pay tribute to the United States Merchant Mariners who served as the fourth arm of defense for our, nas for our nation during the war. Earlier this year, I was proud to sign into law long overdue legislation to award the Congressional Gold Medal to the valiant civilian merchant mariners who maintained critical supply lines to our overseas troops and allies during the Second World War. Many of these mariners endure, endured brutal attacks from German U-boats and more than 6,000 of them perished at sea or were held as prisoners of war. The number includes 142 students of the United States Merchant Marine Academy, distinguishing it as the only one of the five service academies authorized to carry a battle standard. As we remember the tremendous sacrifices of the World War II merchant mariners, we also continue to honor the present day citizen mariners who make up our national, nation's world-class merchant marine. Today, we pay tribute to their expertise, patriotism, and dedication to serving our country and ensuring our national security. The Congress, by joint resolution approved May 20th, 1933, has designated May 22nd of each year's National Maritime Day to commemorate 
the first transoceanic voyage by a steamship in 1819 by the SS Savannah. By this resolution, the Congress has authorized and requested the president to issue annually a proclamation calling for its appropriate observance. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, do hereby proclaim May 22nd, 2020 as National Maritime Day. I call upon the people of the United States to mark this observance and display the flag of the United States at their homes and in their communities. I also request that all ships sailing under the American flag dress ship on that day. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand this 21st day of May in the year of our Lord, 2020, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 244th. Donald J. Trump. Thank you, folks. Uh, I am going to just say one thing. This is a day that we really do dedicate to our mariners uh, for all of the work that they are doing. And you're going to hear from our speakers in just a couple of minutes about uh, the important contributions. Uh, you're gonna hear from Nick Marone, who's the Vice President of the Seafarers International, who is also on the board of our Pro Propeller Club and has been a stalwart uh, in uh, service and support of the Propeller Club. And Nick will be discussing uh, the issues uh, confronting mariners uh, on a regular basis and especially under COVID-19. Uh, next, you'll be hearing from Tori Presti, President National Shipping. Uh, Tori will be discussing the situation uh, for the company in its uh, Texas to uh, Hawaii trade and the issues that uh, National Shipping is uh, also confronting with COVID-19. Uh, he'll be followed by Ed Washburn, Senior Vice President, Fleet Operations, uh, Pesha Hawaii. Uh, Ed will be talking about the issues uh, on the uh, California to Hawaii trade. Uh, he and I talked yesterday about some of the COVID issues that he's having to deal with, uh, a number of challenges uh, he'll bring us up to date. And then finally, uh, Kelly Moore, uh, Senior Vice President, uh, East and Gulf Coast for uh, Centerline Logistics. Uh, he'll be discussing the challenges for the tug and barge industry. And uh, he's uh, also uh, going to tell us a little bit about the update on uh, conditions on the East Coast and the Gulf, as well as the conditions on the West. Uh, so with that, I am going to uh, in find Nick Marone here. Hold on a second. And Nick, I'm going to unmute you and then let you get started. And hold on a second. I'm, oh, well, I can see Nick right there. So I will. Um, hold on, Nick. I am looking for you on this. Where's Nick? Hi. Uh, hey. I got gotcha. you. Okay, Nick. Um, you're first up, and uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, and, and welcome everybody. Uh, Stas, I really want to congratulate you for putting this together. Um, I've been in this business uh, 46 years, and I thought this might be the first maritime day uh, in which we weren't able to have some type of ceremony. Uh, but thankfully, to uh, today's technology, uh, even with the pandemic going on, we are able to have a, a maritime day amongst ourselves, and I want to welcome everybody. Uh, I want to talk about some of the problems we had faced uh, with the crew, um, changes and reliefs and unfit for duties and the restrictions in travel and shelter in place and airports not even open. So um, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I feel we were very aggressive early on, long before the nation took any steps uh, into quarantine. We started working with our operators um, to develop a protocol in which to uh, maintain safety on board the ships. Um, one of the things that is beneficial for us is that the majority of our operators 
uh, belong to the uh, American Maritime Association, and we have standard freight ship and tanker agreements. So we were able to bring in multiple companies at one time uh, in order to standard, standardize a protocol, uh, which, and not having a situation of being part of an association, you would have had to go on to individual companies to establish protocols which would have varied from one shipping company to another, would have been very confusing for the seafarer. So the uh, association uh, provided a great link for us to be able to have a unified uh, protocol. Uh, one of the first things we did was we made an immediate communication with our crews. Uh, and communication to the crews we felt was uh, essential, uh, needed to be top and foremost. Uh, we did not want them finding out about things uh, secondhand. We wanted them to have it directly from the horse's mouth. So that was a priority, which I think worked really well in getting our crews uh, to buy in to the actions that we had to set forth uh, to protect their health and safety. Uh, that was the number one priority, was protecting their health and safety uh, and making sure that the vessel operator uh, was going to be able to continue to operate uh, their vessel. So we proposed a 30-day moratorium on crew changes with restrictions to ships, and we had no problems. The crews understood there wasn't much they could do anyway because most of the ports they went to had shelter-in-place restrictions going on ashore, so there was no place really for them to go where they would normally go for their shopping or to get a meal, pick up supplies, whatever they needed. Um, so that, that worked out uh, pretty well. Uh, we're now kind of moving into uh, a second phase to do larger crew changes. Uh, and what we've done here is we're trying to get the jobs called in about two weeks in advance for the mariners to give them time to self-quarantine at home uh, before they go to the vessel. And then depending on the port of travel or the restrictions of availability, uh, we're trying not to change out any more than one third of uh, each of the departments at one time. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we have some people who have been proven to be virus-free on board as the new people arrive uh, uh, to make sure should anything go wrong at that time, uh, we could take those isolated cases uh, and shelter them in place uh, uh, in their rooms. There's a COVID-19 questionnaire that was developed and agreed to with all the companies. We do a temperature check with the members when they're boarding. Uh, new boards that are reporting to a vessel must um, take off their clothes and put on coveralls that are issued by the company. Um, and they're required to do a 10-day uh, onboard quarantine in their rooms and maintain maximum social distancing and adhere to the best practices by the CDC. Uh, we're aggressively working with the healthcare providers to try and secure some type of FDA approved uh, COVID-19 tests to have a little more security uh, as to uh, who might be infected and who is not. During this obvious pandemic, we've had a lot of situations because of all the credentialing and documentation requirements and passports and TWIC cards. And we went out to these agencies and we worked diligently with these agencies to try and get whatever uh, help we could get from them uh, into dealing with, with, with uh, renewals and expirations and things like that. So travel letters to get through airports, uh, this was very helpful. Uh, the passport office has given us priority for any mariner's passport that's going to expire within 13 months or uh, can file for renewal. The National Maritime Center has been extremely helpful uh, in extending a lot of uh, certifications uh, for six months uh, so the center doesn't get overwhelmed when they don't have anybody reporting to work. I mean, they were, they were happy to have us involved and to help help them. Uh, also uh, figure out some solutions uh, to our needs. So we made some changes in our 401k plan to allow individual withdrawals during this pandemic. We had a lot of members who were stuck ashore 
wanting to get back to work because they were needing to make the money. We had the members on board vessels who were wanting to get home because their families wanted them home during the situation. Uh, and it was quite a quagmire there uh, in the beginning. Again, I'll fall back to uh, our number one priority being health and safety of the crew. And we did that through diligent communication, which we found to be uh, extremely effective. Some of the solutions onto some of the more challenging crew changes, such as uh, crew changes in Diego Garcia, uh, the companies who have vessels in that area of the world have got together, uh, got approval from the Navy and the Department of Defense to charter their own plane to uh, bring some 160 members over there to crew change out amongst some uh, uh, eight to 10 vessels uh, that are situated there. We also got involved by using the U.S. State Department for special needs requests to foreign countries where we have uh, some of our vessels uh, just shuttling in the Mideast and uh, with airports being closed and them not allowing anybody uh, access into the country uh, we found the State Department to be somewhat effective in certain areas to help uh, promulgate uh, a, a crew change. Um, some of the things that the companies have done, which is very important for the crew welfare, because crew welfare at this time was a concern. They're stressed out. They want to get home. They can't get in touch with their families. Uh, we pushed uh, the companies to try and go the extra step, expand or upgrade uh, remote connectivity. Uh, increase uh, bandwidth, get better Wi-Fi, uh, and many, many companies have stepped up and done this uh, as an immediate uh, uh, need to, to keep the crews uh, safe. So that's on the U.S. side. You know, last week, American Shipper, if you people haven't read it, I recommend they had a great article about the stranded crew crisis as a ticking time bomb for global trade. And uh, when you look at the global trade needs of seafarers, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing. Uh, during normal times, there's 150,000 seafarers worldwide that have to go through crew changes in a month. Every month, there's about 150,000 seafarers. Now, this includes all areas of maritime. And obviously, the bigger numbers are the passenger ships, uh, which have 800 to 1,000 uh, crew on board. So, um, they've, they've had some big challenges there. In the international side, unfortunately, they don't have the type of uh, arrangements that we enjoy here with our small maritime fleet in the United States. But the International Transport Federation, the International Maritime Organization, held the company's feet to the fire to give some type of priority to the welfare of the seafarers on board the ship. We found it uh, pretty disheartening that uh, many companies just threw up their hands and simply stated that there was nothing they can do because the countries won't let them in. Uh, the airports had limited flight availability. Uh, and once they met those kind of uh, uh, roadblocks, they stopped uh, and failed to try and figure out a circumnavigation uh, of, of the roadblocks, uh, in which we here in the United States did very effectively. Uh, with the cooperation of our companies uh, and, and the labor unions and all the associations that are concerned uh, with, with uh, crew welfare in one regard or another. In the European side, they relied on these international agencies and they were very successful in getting the bigger companies together that represented the majority of the seafarers in the international fleet to come up with a standard protocol so that all these companies could have some type of program in effect, which would allow them to have some type of confidence that they were gonna be able to do crew changes in a safe and effective way uh, without infecting their ship with a COVID-19 and then uh, the ship crew completely having to be taken off, tested, uh, ship sanitized, maybe having to bring in a whole new crew during these very challenging times would have in most cases, shut the vessel down. So it's, uh, it's been quite a rough road. We've learned a lot from this experience. Um, unlike the proclamation stated, the numbers of losses that uh, we faced during World War II when we had a visible enemy, uh, this is an invisible enemy. Um, and there is no uh, strategy uh, 
uh, our strategy is being developed uh, as this uh, invisible enemy uh, continues to wreak havoc uh, through our communities and through our workplaces. Um, some of the situations were, were really just uh, unbelievable. And, and in one case, um, there was a, uh, a Russian captain uh, that had a heart attack and the ship was off of Indonesia and he wasn't even had the virus and the Indonesia wouldn't even let him be um, evacuated to a, a hospital in Indonesia for treatment because they weren't letting anybody in. And, uh, you know, we just find that to be a, a little bit over the top, uh, kind of a knee jerk reaction, I guess. I guess uh, for most of us, uh, nobody knew how to really handle this. We had an uh, Argentinian uh, patrol boat try to steer away a, uh, a cruise vessel from uh, coming into their port. And um, the operator of this Argentinian patrol boat didn't know what a bulbous bow was. So he cut across the bow and he punctured his own vessel and they sank. <laughs> so, you know, thank you. It's, uh, it, as you can see, the, uh, the challenges have, have been immense and, and, and the reactions are, are uh, even more immense when you're trying to figure out how to deal with this unknown. So uh, in short, I, I do want to compliment our American shipping companies. I do want to compliment our government agencies. Uh, and I definitely want to compliment our seafarers on board these vessels for their patience, understanding, due diligence, and them holding to the motto of the American Merchant Marine that we will deliver during peace and war under all circumstances. And we would like to have some recognition for that. We would like to feel that during these type of situations, we are a responder um, and we want to be treated with the same type of uh, concern uh, that they show uh, for the many other responders in, during this time. And I want to thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker um, is uh, uh, Tori Presti. Uh, Tori? Thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you, Stas. And, and Nick, recognition, there's no question about what you guys have done at the SIU and the officers at the AMO, in our case, uh, for national shipping between Houston and San Juan, Puerto Rico. We are pleased to say that we've had uninterrupted service since the beginning. We've not missed a sailing uh, or delays. The strict protocols that were put in place for the crew and vendors on the vessel uh, have, have supported this. We've done, uh, gone the extra measure to separate our crew from the stevedores, the lashing, uh, uh, the repair guys, the vendors, uh, only emergency repairs. We know it would be disastrous if we had to, if one guy got, had the virus, one person had that virus, we would basically shut down the ship, change out the crew, sanitize the ship. Uh, I need to, I, you can't go on, it's just a nightmare for all of us. Meanwhile, in the background, as you, we still have uh, the, to serve a Jones Act trade where people depend on ocean transportation. I always like to recall uh, the Jones Act supporting of Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico really is more of a utility than, than an ocean transportation product. They count on us. When we started the trade in uh, 2013, there were 3.6 million population in Puerto Rico. Today, it's 2.9 million. The island uh, was bankrupt about two years ago, and it's been plagued by natural disasters for, for years uh, since we've been in the trade. Um, uh, Hurricane Maria was the death blow uh, in 2017. They're still trying to recover from that. Many people don't know, but in December of this of, of 19, and and up till today, there's been earthquakes of about, which we can appreciate living here on the West Coast, of over 3.5 every single day. So if you can realize what that's doing to people's nerves. Um, the island is, is very aggressive uh, in, in, in combating the virus. The island remains under curfew from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. The bars and restaurants are closed. And uh, unfortunately, tourism and the cruise business really is in the distant future. 
uh, unfortunately. Um, however, you know, we always look for the silver lining here and the silver lining for Puerto Rico, I think is the fact that we recognize that we do not produce a lot of a medical equipment and PPE uh, materials in the United States. In fact, I read somewhere it's about 80% produced overseas. Now, Puerto Rico in 1996, they passed a, a law whereby there was a tax advantage for the pharmaceuticals to move in. And unfortunately that expired in 2006, but they, the, the Eli Lilly's and the Johnson and Johnson's and the Baxter Healthcare's and Cardinal Healthcare's are still there. And I think that once again, uh, Puerto Rico will become America's uh, medical cabinet, so to speak. So that's the bright side. Um, you also have uh, companies like Goya, you probably see in the grocery store, Goya Beans. Uh, Goya has quadrupled their business during the crisis, during COVID-19, as it was recommended to eat uh, more beans by the uh, USDA and FDA. So we've seen a quadruple. So there have been some silver linings in the trade. Um, Let's see what else the, uh, blah, 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 blah. what else can I say about it? Uh, return to pharmaceuticals and uh, we become the medicine cabinet. Really, I have, I just have to really compliment uh, uh, Nick and, and, and the uh, SIU and the AMO for keeping us on the track and, I, and also our vessel manager who has adapted uh, uh, pro, certain protocols for crew as well as vendors. Um, and uh, that's basically it, Stas. I don't have too much else to report. We think we will normalize probably July, end of July, really. Middle of June, people will start coming out, going to the restaurants and things like that. But until then, they are opening up phase one. They're very similar to us. So phase one, the construction has started. People are returning back to work, which is a great sign. And all we need to do is get those restaurants and bars open and get tourism back so we can increase our biggest commodity, which happens to be Budweiser beer. With right. that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tori. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Ed Washburn uh, from Pesha, Hawaii. Ed, good morning. Morning. Thank you, Stas, and uh, thank you all the guests for the opportunity to um, talk to you today and, and celebrate and honor our men and women of the U.S. Merchant Marine. Um, Pace of Hawaii operates a fleet of six um, Jones Act uh, vessels. We serve uh, the communities of Hawaii. Um, we have four container vessels, um, one Roro vessel, and one Conroe vessel. Uh, we also have two uh, new container vessels under construction uh, in Keppel Landfills in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, for the commercial side of our business, it's really dependent on the Hawaiian economy, uh, which is really stalled right now. Um, the container volumes are dramatically depressed. The auto volumes are basically nil now, uh, westbound going to Hawaii. Uh, construction equipment uh, is, is modest, but, but certainly has declined. Uh, one area that has increased in volume is, uh, and this is pretty unique, uh, and, and tied to tourism is the rental cars are coming back to the mainland uh, because there is no one to rent them. Uh, that's an increase in volume eastbound, but it's very short lived. Um, the Hawaii economy is uh, <clears throat> jobless rate is estimated now to be 25 to 35 uh, percent. There, there are no tourists. The tourism in Hawaii really doubles the economy. It goes from one and a half million of the uh, regular population to typically three million uh, every day. So, so the the population that's there is is, is just the mainlanders or just the the locals, and uh, and they're in a shelter in place. Um, recently, Governor Ige has signed his eighth supplementary emergency proclamation. Uh, this has extended the 14-day quarantine for anyone coming into Hawaii uh, through June. Um, which is, is smart on his part, uh, but it is, um, it certainly affects our business. Uh, <clears throat> recently, also, Governor Ige has, uh, has just unveiled uh, the state reopening four phase policy. Uh, based on that, we, we do see some, uh, in our forecast, we do see some improved volumes. Um, basically, uh, 
some uh, agriculture and car washes are open in May. In June, some uh, restaurants and museums and theaters will open with safe distancing. Uh, but to be determined still are the large venues um, and the bars and the clubs. Uh, U.S. Transcom has a stop movement order that will continue through June. So there is no household goods um, or military personnel moving to or from Hawaii. Uh, we learned yesterday on the uh, Maritime Administration's call that that will be transitioning to a safe movement policy. Um, so hopefully that, that'll start up soon. Uh, RIMPAC is another big event that happens in um, Honolulu. Uh, it's scheduled for July. Um, it looks like that'll probably be an at-sea only event. Um, so that's um, kind of a depressed market and we're, we're, we're hanging in there and we're, um, we're reacting when we have to. We, there's a lot of difficult decisions that, that have to be made and are being made. Um, we are reaching out um, on the Main Street Loan Program. Uh, we think Pace Hawaii is like uh, the poster child for that, that program. Um, we have ongoing con constructive um, discussions with the White House staff, the Federal Reserve, and the Treasury. Uh, there, that program uh, has some shortfalls, uh, which makes uh, companies like us not applicable. Uh, and we're, we're trying to work through those, so it is a, a program that can help companies like ours, which is 500 to 5,000 employees. Um, so that's kind of the commercial picture on the vessel side. Uh, throughout this crisis, we've, we've been fully operational, um, all our terminals, all our vessels. Um, it's been a, a tremendous amount of hard work to keep that operational. Uh, so hats off to our mariners, our terminal operators, um, and everyone involved in the supply chain. The um, of course, safety of our mariners and their health is our first priority. Uh, and so we're making all our decisions are really, uh, that is the first thing we consider uh, and then as we go down the line, we, we get commercial interest. Um, on board the vessels, we've uh, early on, we adopted the uh, protocols. Uh, they're based on CDC guidelines, as well as what Nick had mentioned, uh, this joint employer, American Maritime Association. Uh, they were instituted very early. Um, they're being followed uh, as a shout out to our mariners. Um, the US mariners are, um, you know, they're very professional. Uh, the seafarers are extremely professional. The officers are professional. They, in our instance, and I'm sure it's same with Tori and all the Nick's guys, they're going above and beyond any protocols. And they have instituted uh, stuff on their own, one-way travel on the ship, uh, certain meal situations that uh, above our protocols, but um, they're doing just a fantastic job. Uh, we have not had any positive cases. We have had symptomatic cases, but I'll touch on later. Um, the, we, some of the things our company does is before anyone travels to the ship, we issue a questionnaire to them uh, at their home, uh, and it's typical CDC guideline questionnaire. But it is a, a stop and don't, don't get on that plane if you answer any of those questions. Um, that would indicate that you may, may carry the virus. Uh, we have, uh, our crew changes are, are relatively normal. Um, we're only uh, U.S. ports, so that's helpful. Uh, we are having flight problems, so we expect that to improve now that um, there are more people flying. But uh, it has been, has been troublesome getting people to the ports. Once we get to the ports, we've, we've been able to get to the ships okay, and I've uh, been able to get to the ship to the airport okay, but uh, the airports have been problematic. Um, we have not had uh, uh, problems acquiring PPE. We did have to go uh, to foreign source um, for masks and that type of stuff. But um, right now the ships are fully stocked. Um, our terminals are fully stocked. Um, so so we're, we're good there. Um, the Coast Guard has been um, very cooperative in extending credentials and we have had some mariners where we've had to do that. Uh, I, I, I can't um, compliment the crews enough that they're professional and conscientious and um, we are grateful for their action and, and their reactions to keep the supply chain going to Hawaii. Um, like I said, we had no positive tests. There's, we have had symptomatic. Uh, that is a, a very disruptive uh, supply chain issue. 
Um, we are in a working group uh, with the Port of LA and the Coast Guard now in Port Long Beach uh, and all other stakeholders to try to streamline that. Um, where the disruption in the supply chain impacts the U.S. community immediately. Um, and uh, so hopefully we can, we can get that streamlined where the impact is lessened on the communities of Hawaii when we have a, somebody that has a fever above 100.4 or if you have a diarrhea more than 24 hours, we are basically disrupting our supply chain completely now. And, and that is the rules. Um, being U.S. flagged, U.S. crewed, uh, completely regulated by the U.S. Coast Guard, not just Port State Control. We we do want some privilege, um, and we're asking for that. Um, so on the that's kind of the, the state of the union for the Hawaii commercial sector. Um, we are on our new build program. Um, we're, we're very pleased that shipyard workers were uh, declared essential workers. Um, the construction of vessels continue uh, on schedule. Um, first one should be launched at the end of the year and the next one uh, early in the first quarter. Um, the shipyard is doing a, a very good job. The workers are excellent. Uh, they're reporting to work every day. They are practicing uh, safe dis social distancing. Uh, there's wash stations all over the shipyard and on board the ship. Uh, those ships are, are, are container ships. They're uh, LNG powered. Um, they will be the uh, most efficient and cleanest ships uh, in, since sail to ever uh, go to Hawaii, so we're proud of that. Um, the first ship, the George III, is uh, about 85% complete. Uh, the engines are in, the hull is just about complete, so uh, it looks like a ship now and, uh, and looks, looks fantastic. Uh, probably the uh, most hydra hydrodynamically efficient hull in the world built uh, at this point. It's a proprietary design by Keppel, uh, and they hired, um, they did their own hull optimization, um, computational fluid dynamic optimization. Uh, ABS Group followed that on and further optimized it, and then it went to the Maritime Research Institute of the Netherlands and did model testing and designed a propeller and rudder to make it um, extremely efficient. So, um, we're, we're happy to, to be starting LNG infrastructure on the West Coast. Uh, last week, we've incorporated our joint venture, uh, West Coast Clean Fuels. Uh, we will be the delivery company uh, that will be delivering LNG to our vessels uh, in Long Beach. And um, it looks like we will also be delivering hydrogen uh, somewhere around the port of San Francisco for the first hydrogen ferry in the San Francisco Bay. Um, so uh, with that said, um, thank you for the opportunity and, and you know we all honor the uh, men and women of our industry and, and let's remember uh, the importance of our industry and the dedication and the sacrifice uh, that all our mariners uh, make uh, every day. So thank you, Stas. Very good. Ed, thank you very much. Thank you for a very comprehensive uh, overview of the situation. You're welcome. Uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Moore, you're up next. Um, Kelly, can you hear me? Uh, I'm trying to get you unmuted. Okay, Kelly. How about now? You got me? I got you. Great. And thank you, Stas, for the opportunity uh, to speak during this very important day of National Maritime Day. And it's nice that uh, we're not forgetting the uh, tug and barge component uh, of the industry that's so critical to our nation's infrastructure. Uh, our nation's been very challenged during this pandemic, and it's nice to see that our, mariner, our, our mariners are being recognized today for their unwavering call to action in support of our nation and keeping everything moving. Um, Center Line Logistics, as I stated earlier, formerly Harley Marine Services, um, is a petroleum transportation company and ship assist provider uh, that has a presence on all three coasts of the nations. Uh, we are the largest oil transportation company on the West Coast, um, working from Alaska all the way down to Los Angeles, Long Beach. Uh, and the company is currently uh, employs approximately 700 employees, both ashore and afloat. Uh, and our mariners are both a mix of union and non-union labor. We're currently operating in all three coasts, uh, right around 150 vessels uh, between tugs and barges. 
When we were confronted with the realization of the COVID-19 outbreak, um, our executive operations, our HSSQE teams, were able to mobilize very quickly nationwide to come up with a sustainable plan to keep our, our crew members and our essential shoreside staff fully operational. Obviously our business is 24-7, 365, so we needed to make sure that we had the infrastructure to keep the business moving. Um, our highest priority uh, was on good sanitation plans for our vessels and our offices, and just trying to mitigate the spread of the virus. So we knew if we were able to accomplish that and get some good protocols in place, we'd have a fighting chance to continue to keep all of our vessels moving, keep our customers happy, keep our stakeholders happy, and uh, help the nation's infrastructure. Um, in, in being able to lock down our, our vessels very quickly, um, you know, the coordination that went into this on all three coasts of our operations was very daunting, and especially we were operating in the epicenter of the virus in New York and New Jersey. That brought on its own set of challenges just with the vast numbers of people that were getting sick back there. We were very fortunate to have fantastic support from not only our customers, our stakeholders, and most importantly, our crews. Our, our crews have not missed a beat during this whole time. Um, we've also had great support from our union partners uh, in assisting with any issues that, that may have come up and working with them on protocols to make sure that, that, that their members uh, were coming to work in a good type of environment. We were also very fortunate to be able to exploit uh, a lot of our relationships with our core vendors um, just so we were able to get all the essential supplies needed in a very fast time period and uh, keep the vessels and the shoreside offices completely sanitized, sanitized and operational. We were kind of fortunate here that this also included, we were able to get respirators out to all of our, all of our um, crew members, both, both on the water and in, on the shore that exceeded the N95 requirement, which I think gave the crew members a really good sense of, um, you know, we were here to make sure that they were all going to stay safe. We were very fortunate that we were able to source those types of half face um, uh, respirators. Um, and again, you know, it was our thing. If we could keep the mariners on the tugboats and the live aboard barges in a safe environment, we felt that would be the safest environment they could be in if, as long as we could keep everybody, everybody healthy out there. Uh, we've been extremely fortunate. Um, we have not had any reported COVID-19 illnesses, and that's a direct result of putting together, I think, a very good solid plan from the inception of the outbreak and having our great employees pay attention and care about the fact that, that they were essential workers and keeping the country supplied and moving. Um, we have not been immune from the downturns in our business volumes on our commercial side. Um, being a nationwide company, every region that we operate in was just a little bit different. Um, we operate the ship assist business on the US West Coast, and that's kind of taking the biggest uh, hit. Like Mr. Washburn said, you know, the, the ships just aren't coming. There's, there's not the demand for products. You know, everybody's kind of hunkered down. So, um, we're estimating on the U.S. West Coast about a 40, 40 to 45% downturn in uh, ship calls, which has had a big effect on, on, on our business, but we are continuing to operate. Our oil uh, demand, the oil transportation side of the business is down about 25% nationwide, uh, but we are fortunate that we have a lot of long-term legacy customers that are um, absolutely supporting us and um, helping us keep everything going. I don't know if any of you have seen anything on the news or anything, but um, the oil industry, if you look off the coast in Long Beach and LA, it's just a myriad of oil tankers, like 10, 20 of them sitting out at anchor right now full of oil because they have nowhere to go. Uh, eventually, we're hoping that they do have a place to go and that will definitely jump step, start the um, commercial side. So we're hoping for that. Um, the most important initiatives we identified early on in the, in the pandemic were kind of the following. We knew that we needed to keep all of our mariners and our shoreside staff 
gainfully employed at all costs. Uh, but very easy to go in a little knee jerk on this and kind of look that we're a little heavy on crewing and this, but collectively the executive team at Centerline said, you know, our, our biggest asset are our Mariners. And we want to make sure our Mariners have good paying jobs, take care of their families. And we were able to keep uh, them, them all employed. I'm really happy to say that we have not had any reduction in our labor pool to date. Um, which I can't say there's, you know, a lot of the other companies are, are, are struggling with this a little bit, but we're going to do everything in our power to, to keep them all gainfully employed and make sure that their families can have a, a good quality of life. Um, I think on the end of the day, I think, you know, a lot of the other people brought up long stuff. We were faced with the exact same, you know, our crew changes. Our biggest issue with crew changes was in the state of Alaska. They came out with some pretty tight guidelines and I, we were having airport issues and trying to get them in with the, with them having to be quarantined and this and that. But we were actually went as far as to charter our own airplane to get all of our crews in and out, um, which was really the only thing that, that, that we could do that made sense to make sure that uh, we could safely get them in and out of the great state of Alaska. Um, you know, I think we should all stand proud today and, you know, the National Day of Maritime Recognition, you know, our troops have answered the call of duty and performed with great vigor and pride throughout this, this entire ordeal. Um, this is just one of many times that the Merchant Marines have been called to duty in support of our great country. And we really should all uh, make a phone call and support a Mariner today um, without the hard work and unwavering support that these guys give us um we wouldn't be in business so thanks again for the great opportunity here today and uh let's hope this thing gets better and we can move forward and get back to normal thank you very much kelly thank you very much for your comments and uh i'm really glad we were able to get the uh, tug and barge industry uh, represented and uh we recognize that you have some unique challenges uh keeping uh, supplies going on both coasts and in the Gulf, and thank you. Uh, I am going to um, open up the, uh, open up the, for, dis for any questions that people have. I can't find the hand raising thing, so I'm gonna have to hope everybody's kind of on the, uh, can hear. Uh, do we have any questions of our panel? Now, I actually, this is Ron Brown. I have, have a, a question for my buddy Nick, if he, if he doesn't mind. Um, yes. Nick, we have three cruise ships at our port right now. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see them. You could probably see them from your office. Have you had any interactions with them at all, or is any assistance you guys are, are providing to the uh, cruise ships that are currently uh, docked at the Port of Oakland? Um, I've not had any direct uh, contact with them. Those are uh, international sailors, uh, but we do have a representative from the International Transport Federation here on the West Coast, uh, Jeff Engels, um, and he would be notified if they had any crew issue, uh, he would definitely be able to go down to the vessel, um, get that information, uh, and then see what can be done. Very good. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Ron. Uh, other questions? Anybody got any other questions for our panel? Uh, uh, I have, uh, uh, Tori, uh, the situation in Hawaii, in, in Puerto Rico that you described, um, it, if so many people have left the island, what's the long-term prognosis for your trade there? Well, it's, uh, I'll be honest with you, it's not that good, uh, uh, Stas. Uh, keep in mind uh, you know, that, that uh, the competition has recently built ships like Ed has, and, and they've got, uh, Tote's got two new LNG ships, Crowley's got two new LNG ships, so while the trade contracts by about 5% per year, uh, the capacity goes up by that. So um, 
the prognosis is going to be tough. The only here are some of the that could happen. I mentioned the pharmaceuticals that could come back. I think we realize that we that eighty percent of all of our goods, as they relate to pharmaceuticals, whether it's gowns or masks or IV solutions, are made outside eighty percent outside the United States. So. That could be a good shot in the arm for, for Puerto Rico. What's happening now is that there's a migration of young, capable, intelligent people leaving the island and coming to, in the old days it was New York, but now it's Florida. Florida is quickly coming a blue state. Uh, they're moving to Texas. So those are the three areas. There's five and a half million people, out, Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto Rico and about 2.9 million left in Puerto Rico. That's one. Another bright spot that they've been talking about is US military. There was talk that after things settled down in the Middle East, that they will restart and look for a base and focus on the North-South Latin American uh, operations. So uh, a base where Puerto Rico housed the base for the Navy, they have shipyards there, they've got beautiful facilities there. So that could come back. If you put 25, 30,000 guys on the ground there, that, that, that'll equate to about 600 containers a week. That's, how I, that's a rule of thumb. So, no, but the prognosis isn't good. It's a tough one. The company, they, 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 they owe, the, the, the country basically owes $75 million, billion dollars in bonds. It owns another $50 billion in unfunded pensions. So they've got a long road to haul. Um, now, the, the, uh, Maria, uh, after the Hurricane Maria, about $17 billion is being released slowly. Trump doesn't really trust the island, nor the island trusts Trump. So it's become very, very slow. They did uh, uh, appoint a czar. They appointed a czar uh, to take care of uh, the disbursement of the $17 billion. So hopefully that, that will be uh, uh, there. But uh, it's, it's tough. There's no doubt about it. It's a tough island right now. Cruise business, gone. When's the next time if somebody's going to get on a cruise ship? Tourism in the Caribbean is gone. It's just not going to be a quick recovery. Uh, Stas, but let me tell you, they, they, they're very, uh, they've got a lot of fortitude down there and strength, and they've been through many, many disasters, and they'll make it through this. Very good. Thank you very much, Tori. Um, Ed, uh, you uh, related the situation in Hawaii. Um, where, at, at, as Tori related, the, the, the tourism business is, is, is gone for at least the immediate future. What's your prognosis for Hawaii's economy and, and the trade there? Um, yes, yeah, Stas, I think um, Hawaii is being um, extremely conscientious in what they're doing to make sure that tourism can come back safely, uh, which is, is a good thing and the immediate effect is, is negative, of course, but uh, we're, uh, June, the, the 14 day quarantine after, at the end of June, that stops. Um, and we think Hawaii is, is poised to prove themselves to be a destination. Um, Hawaii hopes that um, travel likely will not be very attractive. Certainly cruise ship travel is not attractive. Uh, and that Hawaii is the safe destination for people who want to travel. Um, it's going to be a, a slow recovery. The University of Hawaii uh, Economic Research Organization uh, kind of predicts 40% uh, unemployment now, maybe 20% by the end of the year. Um, we think it's going to be a, a relatively slow recovery. Um, we do not think it's going to be the flip of a switch and, and things are back to normal. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're, our forecasts are by the end of the year, we're back to 80% of normal. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kelly, um, one of the issues that uh, we've been hearing on and off over the last couple of years is about the Jones Act. And um, uh, there's been several uh, articles from the Cato Institute attacking the Jones Act. Again, I'm not exactly sure why it's come up now, but uh, you will uh, recall that there's been several efforts to have waivers to uh, allow foreign uh, tug and barge operators to uh, move from the Gulf to the East Coast. 
Uh, what are we doing uh, to protect the Jones Act and why is it important that Americans support the Jones Act? Well, obviously, you know, this comes up all the time. I mean, we, we look at, uh, you know, in a situation on, on opening the door to letting non-Jones Act, you know, vessels start calling in the U.S. We've already had a massive hit you know, through the past years on the decline of U.S. flag vessels. And, you know, that it's just, it would be an absolute horrible thing for us. Uh, you know, you, you start bringing in, you know, not saying that the labor isn't skilled, but it's at a much, much less pay scale, you know, building vessels. I mean, obviously from someone like myself or with a company that I'm with building, building vessels in Asia for my bottom line would be a fantastic thing. However, it would just totally destroy what the U.S. is all about. So I think between AWO, Nick's group does a fantastic lobbying job, uh, making sure that we, we do keep these jobs American, we do keep our vessels having to be made here. Um, it, there, there's really, really no other option. Um, we all feel like if the floodgates get open and this was to happen, the decline of the Merchant Mariner and the industry as we know it will be long gone. So we, we need to fight steadfastly on this. Uh, we need to make sure that we, we're protecting the American Mariner as well as the American way of doing things. It's just the right thing to do. Um, you know, depending on who's in office, they, you know, could go, could go either way. But I feel we do have a very strong lobbying group um, that is obviously dealing with this on a, almost a daily basis. Um, and we just all need to make sure that we're, standing in support of the Jones Act and doing anything we can to keep it going. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick Marone, the Jones Act. Why is it important and why do we why do we why do we continue to have problems with people continuing to go after the Jones Act? <clears throat> well the Jones Act is important for our homeland and our national and economic security. Uh, as we can see with this COVID-19 uh, when you have a crisis like this, you're only going to be able to count on your homeland people. You're not going to be able to rely on international supply chains uh, and things of this nature. So I think the, um, the three foot pegs to the Jones Act is our homeland, our economic, and our national security uh, must be maintained. The other thing that bothers me is uh, you mentioned that Cato Institute. Uh, it's a piece of shit. I don't know how else to put it, but you know, that Cato Institute is nothing but a um, arm of uh, terrorism paid for by the Koch brothers and the billion dollar industries who hide behind uh, a piece of paper like that claiming that uh, this is an interference with the uh, um, economies of United States. We don't know who these anti-Jones Act people are. They obviously must be worldwide uh, uh, interests in, uh, in shipping, um, but the Jones Act for the security of this country is probably the most efficient law that can be held forth, not only for those three pegs of security for United States, but it also creates a $500 billion a year industrial base for the working men and women in this industry. And I don't see any other industry coming in to replace that and creating the $500 billion annual input that this industry provides for this nation and for the workers in this American maritime community. Very good, Nick, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all of the panelists for uh, your contributions. Uh, this is really a, a good event for us to be able to remember the importance of our mariners, uh, of our merchant marine. And as Nick points out, in times of an emergency, you got to rely on your own people. And uh, that's just the way it is. And fortunately, we have the Jones Act to help do that. Yes, yeah, Stas, if I may interrupt, I, I wanted to offer, I. I this is out of my expertise area, but I wanted to offer um, John Garamendi as yes. a legislative, if he has been talked to, 
he actually is passionate about the Jones Act. Um, what's in his, uh, uh, Evie Huang, I'm a customs broker. Um, currently this year is president of uh, Customs Brokers and Borders Association. And once a year we go to our legislatures and advocate for our causes. And um, uh, a couple years ago, we were in Garibaldi's office. He just came back from a session and uh, he had a flyer with him that he was advocating something um, for a Jones Act. Um, he is uh, one of the few who are area experts and I believe once, he, once a month he has a meeting with port stakeholders. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Kelly or Nick, you have uh, interacted with that office before, but uh, he would definitely be on your side and there's a legislative uh, um, concern. He might be one congressperson to hit up on Jones Act, particularly Thank on Jones Act. Thank Just you. I wanted to offer that. Thank you. Well, actually, uh, uh, Congressman Garamendi spoke to the Propeller Club at CMA about a year and a half ago uh, on that subject, and we know him as a good friend. And uh, I can assure you that uh, Nick Marone keeps track of all of our Northern California congressional representatives to make sure that they hold the American line. So, <clears throat> but thank you for that. Um, with that, I want to just uh, uh, tell all of you that uh, the Propeller Club is hosting its next event on Tuesday, June 2nd. And uh, Mike Jacob from PMSA will be speaking about the Howard Terminal Ballpark, a subject very near to E.B. Wong's heart, not to mention Susan Ransom at SSA and a lot of others of us. So uh, uh, there will be an <laughs> We will be getting out uh, next week on that, um, and that is June 2nd at 11, and uh, that will be, um, uh, that will be uh, at 11 o'clock. So it's Mike Jacob, PMSA, and it'll be on the ballpark, and he will be giving us an update about what's been going on and what actions uh, we need to be uh, concerned with. Uh, so... On behalf of the, does anybody have anything else to say? Yes, Tori. On that subject, Stas, on June 6th, two days, or, or June 5th, it is two weeks from today, the 100th anniversary of the Jones Act. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, well, we will do something. Thank you. Uh, so on that note, if uh, does anybody have anything they would like to contribute before we conclude? I want to thank everybody for their participation today. Thank you for making a Maritime Day a Maritime Day. Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you very much for all of the stuff that you do. And for making sure we have an office, Nick. I always appreciate that. So with that, thank you very much, folks. Uh, Ed, thank you. Tori, thank you. Kelly, thank you very much. Nick, thank you. And uh, we will see, I hopefully, some of you uh, June 2nd. And uh, all of you, be well. And again, thank you for your service to your country and your community, keeping our maritime industry open. And uh, Evie and Ron, if you are still available, we'll chat afterwards. Thank you very much, folks, and see you soon. Thank you, Stuart. Thank, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Stuart.